All right. Super excited to have the very talented Luke Dusenberry on the Tricer podcast today. I met Luke probably a couple of years ago, just through Instagram, and he was looking at running some of my stuff. So we did a little trading. He got one of my tripods, and he's a super talented guy. And if you're watching hunt films on YouTube, you're probably watching, you probably watch Luke's stuff. Luke is the man behind the camera. Um, Luke is the guy who gets the nod when Brady goes on a hunt, Brady Miller, because Luke is dumb enough to hunt with Brady and chase him. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to have you on. Luke, what's going on, bro? True. Thank you so much for having me, man. Stoked to be on the podcast. So, yeah, man. Like, I I really wanted to have you on because I really want to talk about, like, I want to film my hunts this year. I want to... I don't want to film my hunts because I suck and I hate filming, right? Like I just, <laughs> I'm the worst at content. My marketing team is just like, why wouldn't you film that? Why wouldn't you? And it's just, like, I try, but I suck. Like I try and get, you see my stuff. Like I'm just like very like coarse. I'm very like rough around the edges. And that's how my filming is as well. Like I try and I just can't capture the moment like you can. Dude, how do you say, It sounds like you're being a little hard on yourself because I see your guys' stuff all the time on Instagram and I'm like, oh, I've that's sick. Or I don't know. I like the cut and dry content sometimes. Yeah. Just like when I see, for example, like a new tripod that you guys are coming out with or some other new pan head or whatever, it's just nice sometimes. Like it's almost refreshing just to see like, all right, this is what it is. This is what it does. This is how much it weighs. <laughs> Boom. I don't know. As a creative, I'm just like, oh, it's nice. Like sometimes just to have that rough, raw and real content. But yeah, I, I was thinking that like today, like I get too excited, right? I know Olin just launched their new adapter and they kept it so quiet for so long. And I was like talking to Nate and I'm like, Nate, how the heck to keep it so quiet for so long? Like, I just want to show everybody. Like, I'm showing drawings and <laughs> pictures and just like throwing it out there. And like, then they launch it with some bitch and video and it's like, you know, oh, yeah. it just looks like rad. And I'm just like, hey, check out this new Zulu 6 thing I'm making. Check out this new panhead I'm making. But yeah, I think people do appreciate that, I guess. So thank you for that. But it's just, you get what I, like with me, you, you see everything I have, right? I'm not really, I'm not very creative when it comes to the contest. I think that's where I'm going with that is like, especially filming hunts. I just, I don't have the eye for it. So you, in my mind, in most people's minds have an epic job. You have this job where I, I feel like you're living your dream because not only are you hunt, filming hunts, you're also filming like some really sick marlin fishing and fishing down in Baja and your travel. I think you did fishing back in, I don't know, Maryland, but like yeah, by yeah. Maine, right? In New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole um, East Coast. So how did you end up here? Did you wake up one day and you decide you're just going to just have these epic adventures or what happened? <laughs> you're like turning down. You're like turning yeah. down work now. Yeah, like we were talking about, like before we started recording the podcast, like the Lord is just really blessed my business and your business, and it's just been awesome to see from afar. But yeah, I would say I definitely feel like I'm living the dream. Like obviously, not everything is sunshines and rainbows, and sometimes the travel can be hard, and sometimes I can be like quote unquote work. But I really do feel like I'm just insanely blessed and really like just living what I'm feeling called to do, which is to do photo, photo and video. And I've been very blessed to be able to do that for the last, goodness, six years full-time. Yeah, six, yeah, 2018 is when I went uh, full-time into freelance when I left college. But yeah, it's just been one crazy wild ride for people that have like followed, followed me along since the beginning. But like I was saying, it's just all the opportunities I've been able to do are pretty much, if I was like to be dreaming, like daydreaming or whatever in college, because that's when I would start really getting into photography and stuff and just having these like aspirations and hopes of, dude, I want to go here and do this, or I want to tell this story or do that. If I was to write all those down and then like to fast forward to now, I would like all those dreams that I had would have pale in comparison to like what's happened. If that makes sense. Like basically just what's happened in the last six years has blown away everything that I could have really ever hoped for. And I just feel honored and, and blessed um, that that's happened. So um, but yeah, so getting into what you're saying about filming your own hunts, like what kind of hunts do you have coming up this year? Dude, for one, to piggyback on what you just said, God's plan is so much bigger than our plan. So mm. that's, what's awesome. With what God did. It's like, you had an idea, like I had an idea for Tricer and where it is today is so much better than I ever thought it was going to be. And you had an idea to be do filming. And it's when you step out in faith that God really shows up and then like, no, let me show you what the master artist can do. Exactly. With your life and what you can do. And that's what God did there. What else do I have planned? Dude, I, I have nothing on the, I have one, let me see. So right now on the books, I am definitely going to Sonora. 
who got that hunt booked in January. Nice. I struck out in Arizona for elk, right? And I definitely didn't draw a pronghorn. I'm definitely going up to Wyoming to hunt white antelope. I've never killed an antelope before. I don't know if you know who Dylan Hyatt is. He's like fish hunt too on Instagram. Sounds we work a little bit. Yeah. So I'm going to go hunt with him because like I'm going to fly to Casper and then go hang out with him and then go out with him and go hunting with him up there. So that would be a kind of a fun hunt. So I'm going to do that. I really want to draw a Colorado mule deer tag this year. So I think mm-hmm. that's a hunt I want it. That's the hunt I want to film. Mm-hmm. It's like a Colorado mule deer hunt. And then who knows, maybe I'll draw, I mean, I'm putting it everywhere. So I'll put it in New Mexico. So if I draw one of those, maybe I'd film that. Like I'm definitely gonna put in for antelope, oryx, oddad, mule deer, probably pronghorns. So I'll put in for all the species in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Right now it's an open slate, man. And if things, everything falls apart, I'll go hunt Eastern Oregon for mule deer because I have enough points to do that as well. So I have some like fallback plans, but as of bitch and hunts, nothing's really on the ticket yet. Very cool. Yeah. If you, if you end up drawing Eastern Oregon, let me know. Cause I, I grew up hunting out there as a kid. So I can maybe help you know, depending on the where you draw, I could maybe help point you in the right direction. Nice. Yeah. We drew a, an elk tag over by Hills Canyon in one of those units over there. Mm-hmm. And like in my mind, I never thought Oregon could be like that gnarly. Oh yeah. And it was every bit as gnarly as anything I've ever been to before in my life. It was just like, we made some mistakes. We, we definitely <laughs> hiked, like and we pigeonholed. I learned a lot. So like we, I had the idea, like everything, if you just go further, everybody else, you're going to kill something. And so I hiked like down into Hell's Canyon. Oh no. But the problem was, <laughs> yeah, dude, you've seen it. The problem was like there was we pigeonholed ourselves so we couldn't really go anywhere once we were down there mm-hmm. right so like even if we saw an elk it was like getting to it was gnarly we didn't we only ended up seeing like six elk and they were all cows maybe a spike i can't remember um and we had to hike out of there three days in because it was like it's only, oregon only does five day seasons mm-hmm. if you don't get it done it's not like you can be like okay we have 10 days to get this thing done if you pigeonhole yourself the like that, you can pretty much, yeah the pressure's on we blew it and then we moved and we got to a spot where we found a ton of elk by that point, we had one day left and we got on a bowl, but it just didn't happen, right? We just didn't give ourselves the time. I learned a lot of that, huh? I learned you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. Sometimes it's better to, if you're going to hike into something where it's just like you're committed to only that one little area, you probably shouldn't do it, right? Mm-hmm. Unless you're positive that there's some elk in there. And also that area, we could have probably, if I did it again, I would have stayed up on top and glassed down into it. And then if I saw it, then went after it, right? And then yeah. you could have been more mobile in that unit, right? It's not always bad to work the roads, right? Like, oh, for sure not. You know, in some of those units, like it would have been more beneficial for me to work that ridge, get a, come in glass, or maybe even hike in a half mile, get to a glassing knob and glass down, then hike in where, versus we hike down into this thing. And it was so steep. And I have pictures where you're having to hold on to trees to go down. And if you let go, you were going to like die. <laughs> like yeah, it was just not stupid, stop right? until you hit the river. <laughs> not stop until you hit the river. So like it was just steep. So it was a definitely learning experience, but the spot we went to after that, we saw a ton of bucks and then uh, a bunch of elk. So I'm like, man, I want to go back and hunt hunt deer here. And I think it's like a three point unit or four point unit. I, mm-hmm. I think I have seven points now for deer. So I definitely can like average somebody in that hunt and go over there and hunt deer. Very cool. Yeah. I've definitely been on my share of hunts where we pigeonholed ourselves pretty hard. <laughs> That's like what that's been one of the biggest things I've probably learned, especially in my personal hunts. Cause like on personal hunts, like it's not just me like out there with a hunter who has, who's spent most of the year planning and preparing mm-hmm. and has plan A, plan B, plan C kind of planned out. So that's one thing I've learned in my personal hunts is I need to have a plan B, a C, a D and not like totally pigeonhole myself. Unless it's like an area that's like tried and true. I know it like the back of my hand, he scouted it, put trail cams in all that stuff. But even then, like I, we went elk hunting this year here in Idaho and I put cameras in, scouted all summer and there was like elk in there every day. And then like right when season came, they all went out and I couldn't find where they went. So we had to like go to a completely different part of the unit, but it was fun. We back in there, camp for two days. We like didn't even see a single elk after my cameras were like totally full of pictures of elk. And I was just like, oh. so I had to swallow my pride and my best friend and my wife because she I was my wife's first time hunting with me like where she had a tag and I was like, all right guys, I know we hiked in here with 60 pounds on our back, but I want to pull the plug and go somewhere else. Cause it's just not worth it. Like we spent two days looking and didn't see anything and time is precious on those hunts. Mm-hmm. And 
especially like during hunting season for me, like I just have a lot of hunts like on my calendar. And so like my personal hunting time is very limited. So it's okay. We're not going to see an elk here. We just need to roll with it and go to another place. And so we went to another place and got into them and had one heck of a season. Didn't get one. My buddy got a cow, but it was still like one of the funnest seasons we've ever had. Yeah. Your wife is your wife's name. What's your wife's name? Alexa. Alexa. I always like see Amazon. you tagging. Yeah. Alexa. Am, yeah. Alexa. <laughs> So speak to that. I could not, I've been married almost 20 years. I've been with my wife for 21 years, right? Our 20 year reunions coming up this year for high school. We got together her senior year or junior year. Love her to death. Go on dates once a week, five kids together. No way are we hunting together. First so, of all, congratulations. That's awesome. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I think I started bringing Alexa to like the Western Hunt Expo back in 2021 or it was 2021 or 2022. I can't remember. But yeah, she had obviously seen and met people like I was friends with, like in the hunting industry, oh. quote unquote, or just friends of mine that are into hunting or even like her brother, for example, is a duck hunting and fishing guide in North Carolina. So she's like always grown up, like exposed to hunting and not like physically, like firsthand doing it, but like third person. And so my wife, I, I brought her to the Western Hunting Expo back in, I believe it was 2021. The first year it was open after COVID. It may have been 2022. I can't quite remember, but anyway, so I brought her to that and she got to expose and, and got to see like the hunting industry, quote unquote, like the face of it, like all the different brands and the kind of like the culture and stuff. It's just like a really good way, I think, to like experience and, and to meet people as well, but just to get a whole experience on what the hunting industry like looks and feels like uh, right now. And I've been very blessed and fortunate to get to know quite a few people in it. So I got to see a lot of people there and, and reconnect, but also introduce them to Alexa and stuff like that. And she just got to see got to see a couple of my photos like on posters or booths and stuff and so that was like cool cool for her to see that but yeah so she's like, i think i want to get into it and fast forward to that fall at elk hunt in oregon and she wanted to go with us and backpack and camp and go off trail hike through deadfall do the whole nine yards and she's in like, really good shape and like really loves like backpacking and hiking has done that a lot but like not a lot of off trail stuff so i was like prepping her i was like okay we need to get just like some good boots a good backpack and if you can totally like you're physically fit enough to do it, but it's, it's going to be more so a mental thing. Like I've mm -hmm. seen pretty physically fit people like go and do this and it's a lot, it's just as much physical as, as is mental. So I was trying to prepare mentally for that. And it definitely was like a hard hunt, like, like to spoil it. Like we didn't really see many elk besides the first few days and we hiked a lot of miles and it was steep and gnarly and, and thick, but we had great friends we were out there hunting with and, it ended up being more of a, a bow hiking mission, but it still was a lot of fun and she was hooked and we had some great, we had a couple of really close encounters on day one, um, but it was just a, a great experience overall and she was definitely hooked after that. Yeah. As far as like secrets on, you know, how to get your wife into hunting, I don't know. My wife just naturally was into it. Her brother's a hunting guide and fishing guide in North Carolina. So she's been like exposed to it through her family over the years and I don't know, just something she wanted to organically express. I never wanted to like, force her to do it or anything like that i just just was doing it on my own and she just showed interest and wanted to join in on it so but yeah now she's a killer she shot a bear this year with her bow and yeah really? now she's totally hooked but yeah that's your head yeah my wife is like that's your thing i'm good with that Have yeah. <laughs> which is like, totally I'm okay taking, too yeah like i took them on a coos deer hunt one time and like they stayed i brought the trailer out to i have a lance like a really nice travel trailer and they were miserable like she loves we go to the desert we camp in the desert we, we do that as a family we do we go to campgrounds we beach camp all the time but yeah the hunting thing she's yeah i'm good bring me to a campground bring me some other showers where there's toilets where we can go to the store and get pizza like i don't be in the middle of nowhere like i want those amenities yeah, it's not definitely not her thing, which is fine. I guess it's just not everybody's thing. I have totally fine. five kids and I'm still trying to figure out like my, I have my boys hunting since they were I mean, four or five years old. And like my 17 year old, I'm like, well, he could, he didn't really go out on his own this year at all. I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know if he's going to hunt. If he's really going to, I brought, if, unless I'm, you can only drive into water for so long. At some point he's got to do it. Like this year he's going to be 18. I'm like, you're going to have to like, get your own tags and go out and hunt, bro. He went to Utah on his own last year with, with one of my buddies and he killed a deer. So we'll see how it is. Some people really love hunting and some people like hunting. They do it. And there's, For sure. There's a difference between like you 
and then a guy who has a hunting license. A lot of guys go hunting every year, right? And then there's you who spent, like, how many days in the field did you spend hunting last year? Just hunting? Goodness. Or I would say, hunting and filming. Yeah, I would say, yeah, like combined from, I didn't really do anything in August last year, which is rare. But yeah, from September through like even February, because I had some hunts in February this year. I bet close to 80 or 90 days. That's crazy. Yeah. It was, and that's like maybe even a little low, like conservative, but yeah, it was definitely one of the busiest hunting seasons I've ever had. I think I filmed seven hunts. Yeah, not including February, seven hunts. Um, but yeah, every hunt I filmed this year also, every single guy got one and a nice mature like representation of the species we were after. It was just such a blessed season. It was crazy. Flew by, but at the same time, I was just like trying to savor every moment because I felt like every hunt just like one of the most incredible things or just like something that I just made the story just happened and I was just like wow that is so insane like I I don't know if I'll have ever another season like that again of just having that many hunts be successful like top-notch story just yeah just super blessed so eight or nine days in the field at least seven mature animals and I already know this but you pack them out too yeah sometimes we'll have enough guys when it's you know I'll just take like the loose meat or something but there's definitely hunts where it's maybe just me and the hunter. Like if it's me and Brady, for example, or, or whatever. And I don't want to, I want us to get the pack out done as soon as possible. And, but also not be like, oh, I'm just here to take photos. I want to be a servant and helpful and, and do what I can to, to help the hunt go well. And whether that's needing help packing out the animal or needing help glassing sometimes on a, a glassing knob, I, I just try and fill in holes while also focusing on capturing the story and the imagery with photos and video that propel the story along and trying to think of questions to ask to get good talking points or whatnot, d- depending on how the story is shaping up to be. But yeah, I don't know. I love all the, the various aspects of it. It's, I don't know. You just got to be on your toes a lot, no matter what's happening. So there's always something to do with it. So that's why I love it. Sometimes you're going from one hunt in Colorado and then driving all night and then going to another hunt in whatever, Idaho. Correct. Yeah, sometimes I, like, I I try and have a couple of days in between, but like sometimes where it's two really like good hunts that I really want to do, I will like stack them or plan them or I'll try and plan a route. So for instance, like I had a hunt, I had two hunts this year. Like one was in Southern Oregon, where I'm from, and then the other one was in Nevada, and I was able to time both the seasons with the hunters and the dates that they wanted me there. So like it perfectly lined up. So I have a full travel day from Oregon to Nevada and vice versa and i, I want to say i put 3500 miles in my car on my truck that on that trip <laughs> and it was like 20 days but that's just part of it part of filming haunts and just part of western hunting in general is driving a lot and actually i've been, come to enjoy like the road trips and that kind of stuff listening to podcasts or music and getting to, yeah <laughs> getting to like debrief a little bit too like creatively just be like okay like i can think of like story like lines or Maybe like an interview question I want to ask or just like a simple, like any like creative shots I want to try and get or anything like that, or like get inspiration from like those long car rides just to decompress. I don't like it because I get stiff afterwards and have to like stretch and stuff, especially after a really physical hunt. But, but yeah, I do, I do enjoy like the road warrior living on the road aspect of it. Just sleeping in the back of the truck, just going from place to place. Basically just be like, Oh, Hey, here's a pin be here at this day kind of a thing i don't know it's i don't know the closest thing i think of to being like a sailor like on the ocean back in the day just you don't really know where you're going sometimes but you just know it's gonna be awesome and just going where the wind takes you a little bit i have to imagine because brady doesn't even talk about like the state he's in does he wait until is it like mission impossible okay now tomorrow's the day here's the pin you're going to Oh yeah, yeah. Is it that hardcore? <laughs> no, Brady's one of my favorite guys in the world to film. I absolutely love that guy. Yeah, so like sometimes, a lot of times I'll start like because we'll talk quite a bit just about the seasons or you know what you draw or whatever, and then he'll be like, "Oh yeah, so I've got a tag for a deer, and these are the rough dates. Are you interested?" In, or for example, and I'll look at my calendar and I usually try and do everything I can to film with Brady at least once a year. So I'm like, "Yeah, like I, those dates work for me." And then that's all pretty much, I know, but basically I've worked those dates. And then about a month out, I'll reach out to him again and be like, okay, so it's in this state. (laughs) 
And then about a week. Oh, you don't even know what state it's in? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then maybe like a week or two out, I'll be like, okay, like, where do you want me to meet you? Because sometimes it's like a pin, like a campsite, or sometimes it's maybe <laughs> near this random town. And then we'll drive in from there. But they just kind of yeah. open a bag yeah. your head. <laughs> yeah. No. So that's definitely like one of my clients where I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's, I'm signing up for a venture. I don't really know what to expect, but he also does prep me well. It's like, okay, you need like this certain gear item that's like kind of unique to like, this sort of mission we're going on. But yeah, I know, I, like I said, I, I love the uniqueness. I love the like mystery box of I never really know what is going to happen. I know that's one of my favorite parts about filming hunts, especially just because you truly never know what is going to happen, how the story is going to unfold. And that's one of my favorite parts about it. It's not like there are parts that are like formulaic in terms of the creative aspect of it, but I do love that like you just genuinely know, you never know what's going to come out from behind the timber or how it's going to happen on day one versus day 10. So that's one of my favorite parts about it. Are you, you said you're doing a lot of, I imagine you're doing a lot of truck sleeping. Have you tried the canvas cutter yet? Yes, I actually, that was one of the biggest upgrades I had this year. Um, awesome. Yeah. I, so I have a six and a half foot truck bed, so I can like sleep in it pretty comfortably. I'm six two. Mm-hmm. So I had to basically just roll that canvas cutter out in the back. And then I have a canopy as well. So it's like a protected little cabin basically. And I just roll back there and have my stone glacier sleeping bag and I just crawl in there and just sleep and it's pretty awesome and i slept in there gosh probably 25 to 30 days this year in the back of that thing and it's pretty nice i need to get one more i need to get one more of them because like it's we do a lot of i my like my father-in-law goes crazy because i never want to stay in a hotel i always want to stay with my truck because one of the trucks full of like expensive stuff yeah Oh yeah. And I don't, and I just don't want to be that guy who like goes in overnight and then some freaking tweaker shows up and steals oh, yeah. out of the truck or, or I unload the whole truck and reload it. But the canvas cutter is so nice, especially cause like half time you pull off, you don't want to set a tent up. So then you're like laying out there the wind yep. or on a tarp. Dude, you can put that canvas cutter out and just sleep on the ground. It doesn't matter if it's windy, rainy, whatever it is. It's legit. So I want to get one more at least. So I can do some adventures with my kids. I, I want to do, I like to do coyote road trips or, or dirt mm-hmm. bike road trips. I take their bikes, drive the truck, pull off, sleep, then go ride, explore, do some coyote hunting. So I want to get another one. It's definitely yeah, they're awesome the for any sort of hunt like that. Because like, like we were saying too, like about your like Hell's Canyon hunt, like not every hunt is six, seven miles deep, sleeping under the star. Like some hunts are like not road hunting, but you're going back to the truck every night or going back to like a campsite off the road kind of a thing. And that's like, when I use that canvas cutter, it's so nice. Or just, or just be able to truck camp and come back and just crawl on that thing. And because like several of my hunts this year, like it would have been foolish to hike in more than two miles because there's just another road you know, at that two mile point. Cause there's just like roads everywhere and like certain units. Yeah. And that four inch foam pad is just so luxurious. It's so oh, yeah. nice. Are you running? I need to get like one of their, I don't know. I need to get a sheet or something. I, don't, I didn't run a sheet on it this year. I want to get a sheet. Are you running a sheet on it or just sitting in a sleeping bag and helping? It? Yeah. I just went to Walmart and I just got, I got like a little like mini, mini pillow in there too. That's kind of bougie, yeah. but I have like a little pillowcase for that. And I've got a nice little stretchy sheet that goes over the, the foam. I still need to wash it. I, I will admit I have not washed it from this season. So I do need to do that. Just another piece of gear maintenance, but, but yeah, that was pretty awesome this year. And I have a little, the little bug net for it too. So if I want to use it in the summertime. And it's like really hot. I don't have the canvas like all the way over me. I can just use that. If you guys don't know what it is, the canvas cutter is like a bedroll. So you've got like a foam pad and then like a canvas, almost like a bivy, but it's bigger than a bivy. It's a pretty big setup. If you're not going to backpack with it, it's probably three foot wide and it rolls up into, a, I don't know, 18 inch round ball. And you basically have your everything in there. Like I keep my sleeping bag yeah. in there, keep my pillow in there, have a sheet on the bed. You just roll that sucker out, pop a couple pulls up and you're sleeping wherever you go. So it's like a cowboy bedroll. You don't even have to run the poles if you don't want to, but I like having stuff off me. I don't like this stuff in my face when I sleep. Yeah, no, I used, I actually used it this weekend. I was out in the desert with a buddy of mine. We were just shooting some rifles and just hanging out. It was the first time we hung out in probably like six or seven months. But yeah, we were out there shooting rifles and just kind of hanging out, doing some hiking. And then we didn't want to set up a tent. So we're just like, all right, so sleep in the back of our trucks. And we just jumped in there. So it's pretty slick. But yeah, and, and all the guys over there at Canvas Cutter are awesome too. Like, Schaefer and Seth, they're all awesome guys. Yeah, they're really good dudes. Yeah, I want, I want to talk to them again. We'll get another one because it's just highly recommend it and awesome dudes. Like you said, just awesome dudes. 
build some cool stuff. Um, so if you, I, want, I have a few questions. I'm intrigued. You're spending 80 to 100 days in the field. I want to know about physical fitness. And I also want to know about like, you have to have a pretty good gear list critiqued now and now, like a very minimal gear list that you run all the time. Like, you got to know it works now. Right? Yeah. So like, the, I guess, let's go to the gear away first. I, I don't really care so much about your fitness because you're obviously in shape and you just, we'll talk about that a little bit if we, if we get into it. But I feel like when you first get into backpacking or backpack hunting, you buy a bunch of crap you don't need. And right, like oh, I think I spent 60 days in the field this year. Not always in a tent. I mean, a lot of days in a tent. And I don't have a lot of the, like the, I don't want to say gimmicky stuff. I don't have all this. Like you go to R, like REI, you go to REI and you're just like, oh my gosh, they're just taking people's money. Oh yeah. Like, it's just like you're in there and you're buying Left like right. the craziest. I was at an event this weekend and they were selling portable toilets that you bring, like a pop-up that you bring with you to put over you in the field. And I'm just like, who the hell would buy that? It's like a pop-up that you yeah. backpack with so you don't have to poop in the open. So it's just like, there's stuff like that, right? Yeah. So what is your, you have to have a base kit. What are the gear items? Like what tent are you using? What are they you out? Know? Yeah. So I've actually thought about like not putting together like a little YouTube video about this just because I mean, every hunt is so different for the most part. Like no hunts like truly the same. And especially with filming a hunt, like you're already having, depending on the hunt, like an extra like 15 to 25 pounds of gear, depending on the type of hunt or the style of hunt or like what you're going for creatively. So throw that on top of a normal 60 pound pack for six days or whatever. It's like a lot or it can be, but all I have to say, I do want to do like a video one day of just like breaking down for just like day hunting. Like when you're coming back to a truck every night, this is my gear setup. And then Mm -hmm. five day hunt, this is my gear setup, 10 day hunt, this is my gear setup. But yeah, as far as like the things that kind of don't change, just with that. Yeah. So I used to have, I used stone glacier backpacks. I used to use a 5,900. And that was a great pack. I want to say it's somewhere around like 70 liters equivalent. And then I started hunting with Brady and realized I needed a bigger backpack <laughs> basically because there was this one hunt we did. And I literally was like, I was lucky enough to bring some dry bags. And I was like, at the end of the hunt, I was like strapping dry bags onto my pack. And I just had all this just to fit all my stuff. Plus half the mule deer we were carrying out and stuff like that. So after that hunt, I went to the 7,900 which I think is like one of the biggest packs out there on the market. But especially like I was saying for like filming a hunt when you already have to have extra gear, just having that extra large backpack that can also be cinched down and compressed to a pretty small normal size pack when you need it has been amazing for the last two or three years. I've been running that one. Um, I like the overall style. When it comes to like style, I'm like pretty minimalist and I really like the style of the Sun Glacier packs. Like, how it has the beaver tail open, which I can just open it and see everything. And I typically will put my camera cube insert, which I can get to more later. So I have all my camera gear out at the bottom, um, depending on how much weight I have in my pack. But I always try and put the, the heaviest stuff at the bottom, which is usually my lenses and other things like that. But I'll usually have you know, just quick access to that with that pack, which is pretty awesome for a pack that size to have such quick access. Um, and then just how like versatile it is. I can you know, put a, a lens or a spotter in the spotting scope pocket and I can have just my random junk drawer of stuff in the top lid and just have my water and toilet paper and just a water purification like in the, the beaver tail zipper compartment just for like quick access or a pair of gloves or something. Like it's just a really good pack, I think, for filming hunts specifically. Yeah, I'm thinking about I, I'm not thinking I'm going to go to a bigger pack this year. I'm gonna run the XO. Mm-hmm. And run. I had the 32 now I have the 4600, which is a great pack. And until I started carrying around like a BTX, and mm-hmm. then until I started carrying around cameras. And Ooh, so now yeah. I want more space because I just don't have enough space. Yeah. So I want I like more of the 6,000. I want like a six six to 7,000 pack only because like I can roll it down. I don't have to use the whole thing. <laughs> but it's annoying, especially when you do a yard sale and you got to try and get all of it back. Like, sure, you got to fit. But getting to fit in there three or four times on a hunt is annoying. Oh, yeah. I don't want that more space. It's just, oh, I can easily fit everything back in here. I don't have to like play Tetris to get everything back in my pack. Um, yeah. Remember the exact order of how things go back. Yeah, in there. exactly. Exactly. Because that's, like, cause that's the thing. Like, when you start carrying gear and lenses and bigger spotters, mm-hmm. like you're saying, it's not just the weight, but it's also like the just the space oh, yeah. those things take up in the, in the oh, volume of the pack. Huge. But I've heard great things about the XO. I've just personally never run one. Run one. I love it. I absolutely love everything they're doing up there, Steve and Mark. It's 
a phenomenal pack. And I think they're, they, this year they only have like a 56. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm going to continue to run XO for the majority of my hunts, but I might mm-hmm. look at going to the Stone Glacier or maybe even the Initial Ascent has a big one. They do, yeah. Um, I'm sure, pretty sure Everly Stock has a few. And Everly Stock are really good, good dudes too. And I don't know. I just got to look at it and see what I want to do. I, I just, I know that like running the 4600 was really tight with the BTX. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, it just takes up so much room. And now that I've run the BTX, like I won't go to Colorado on that high country mule deer hunt this year, but I want to draw without a BTX. So I know I'm going to need, need space. Like I'm just going to need the space for it somehow. So I'm going to figure that out. So you got the pack, you're running the 7,900, or 7,900, like you said, 7,900, yeah. Stone Glacier. <laughs> what about sleep system? Yeah, sleep system, like I said, like for, I cater this more toward like a backpack style filming hunt. Typically, it, it depends. Sometimes we'll all share a sleep system, like a Seek Outside, Cimarron, TP, something mm-hmm. like that. But sometimes I'll have my own TP because the hunter wants his own TP or, you know, or just maybe it's just me and the hunter. For example, so we'll just bring two different shelters just because that is part of it is like I'm 6'2", so I'm a bigger guy, but I'm also like carrying all this extra gear and sometimes it's a nice spread it out or just if I need to dry something, I can dry over there. So I opt for the, it's called a Seek Outside Eolus. It's a two-man tent technically and I run an insert with it, but I really like that tent because I can either have the insert or not if I really need to shave the weight. I typically bring it because I want to say like with the fly and it sets up with just two trekking poles, but I want to say the fly and the insert is still less than, I want to say two and a half pounds. I know it's less than three, but I just found that a really good spacious um, setup because I can have my sleeping pad in there, my sleeping bag, and then I can have also extra room in the insert for my gear. I can get organized with my batteries. I can get organized with my lenses or anything I need to like hang up or dry. Um, and then I can have either entrance of the t- the TP to keep my backpack on one side or however I want to do it or have one side that just has like a little pad that I can put my shoes on and off and, and go out that way kind of thing. So I really like that setup, even though it is like a little you know, bigger, not like quite as like minimalist as I was talking about, but it, it's, I feel like for the weight, it's just really pretty clutch. Yeah. I shelter wise, like I, I do, I have a seek outside TP that I run, but I'm really like, I'm like the Hillenbergs. Mm-hmm. something like i don't know i've gone i don't know i'm probably gonna go back to a tp at some point you know i want to run a stove i haven't done that yet i kind of i like the floored tents and i like i, I don't know there's something about the comfortable I do too. tent. There's something about the comfortable tent yeah, i know the floor of this tent's like the cool thing to do and everyone's doing it and you just get so dirty <laughs> and get, it's so hard oh, not yeah. to be dirty <laughs> you bring a tarp and your tarp's getting dirty and like i could care less about the creepy crawlers it's just man like i stay in the hillenberg and it's got a big old vestibule on it and i can get in there and it's just not only that it just doesn't get the drafts underneath it that like you know i guess you can go do the rocks and do the whole thing and i talked to a hunt about this and he's no way you got to do tps right there obviously those guys are hardcore tp guys at gritty yeah but man like i just there's something i don't mind bringing thing bringing a little more weight and having a very comfortable shelter because it's 100%. one thing like to be getting your teeth kicked in all day but then when you're having to sleep and you're getting like drafts in there, especially I use like a, I use a quilt, like you're getting drafts under your tent or it's just, I want to be comfortable. <laughs> so like yeah. bring a little more weight is worth it. That Eolus too, that's the one that has, I want to have those guys on. Do you have a contact at Seek? I don't know. No, I'm going to, I got to call them. I want to have them on and talk to them about their stuff. That one has that like new, like they have like a really innovative, not even a zip, but like a pole or something on the end of it to open up, right? Is that the, that t- yeah. So the fly has some sort of, it's like a drawstring. It's hard to explain. Mm-hmm. It's like a drawstring with like a, a bungee clamp. cord like thing, right? like this thing. Yeah, and like, you just pinch it and you just slide yeah, it. Yeah, it's pretty slick. It boggles my mind when I use it because I'm just like, how did how does this work? But I just know like I just pinch it and you know, open it up like that. But it's pretty slick. Like I was saying, if you need to run it floorless and just shave all the weight you can, you have the option. But most of the time, I bring the fly, and it's it is pretty tight with two people. I, I've done it with two people. So it's tight, but for a one man, it's just awesome because you're it has the waterproof bathtub bottom. So I can have all my gear in there and not have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Don't have to worry about like dew or condensation as much because I can just vent it really easy with that little sliding thing. And then I'll run a quilt like in August, the first half of September, but I tend to sleep a little cold just in my own personal experience. So I've, I've just switched to the 15 degree, just full on mummy bag from Stone Glacier. I, I switched to that 
by the end of September. And I just basically run that to the end of the season. I don't have anything technically colder or rated for colder than that, but maybe this year I'll try and invest in something. But I've just been trying to invest a little, a little by little as much as I can for the last three or four years. But everybody knows it, it's expensive, but good gear's worth it. Yeah, you just keep adding them on. You, know, you buy good stuff. Like I was at a sports station yesterday with somebody, and I've been running the same Thermarest pad for like eight years. Like, haven't yeah. cool it. Like the X-Therm, like, it's just a phenomenal pad. I know it's going to work. Yep. I know we're going to this pad out, and like, I know it's not going to pop. I know it's going to work. It's so, like, we do, it's worth it. But then one time I bought, like, a climate. I shouldn't say the name. Whatever. I bought a climate, something off of a camel fire. Mm-hmm. And I think popped, like, the first night. And there is nothing worse than sleeping on the dirt. Like sleeping on rocks, not having a pad there. Like oh, that yeah. is the worst. Like it sucks. So like a good, good pad is worth it. I actually switched this year to, I think it's like a, I think it's a big Agnes pad, but it's like mm-hmm. a four inch thick one. So I got one of those. Is it, what color is it? It's turquoise or blue. Okay. It's probably like I think it's the Q, Q core or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it's like a freaking king bed. It's so nice. That's the one and I like, use. I, I have the red one. I think it's called the Rapide SL. Mm-hmm. It's four inches thick. It's so nice. Yeah. So that's <laughs> I, always like, get, I always get like compliments on it. They're like, dude, that pad is so big. I'm like, it's worth it. Because that's like so what so you're saying. It. It's just so when you get you know, your teeth kicked in all day long in a hunt and you're just tired and hungry and exhausted. And it's just so nice to come back to a pretty nice, comfortable shelter where like you feel clean or you can be clean. Like maybe just a little wet white bath and and clean yourself off and then you just get in there and everything's dry and not dirty. And I don't know, that's like the part of me, like on those hunts that I like, I'm a little bougie with that. I do like to be clean and, and not it completely in the dirt. I've done plenty of hunts and, and will do plenty of hunts for, I'm in a, a floorless TP, but it's just nice when you can have that floor in the bottom with the zipper and you know, no bugs are getting in there, all that stuff. And you can just be nice and comfortable in your little heaven on the mountain. Yeah, the pad is, it weighs a little more, right? So I think it's like a pound or maybe a little more than a pack, 18 ounces. First, like, I have some, like the Thermarest, like the, the yellow one and the XR, and they're like 10 ounces or whatever. Mm-hmm. But man, like, it's, there's something about having the square big, cause being able to roll around and like, be, oh, yeah. have your feet not come off of it. Like, it's just so nice to be comfortable that thing. Because I roll a lot. My, that's why I use a quilt. Because if I sleep in a mummy pack, like, I end up with like a wet blanket. Like, I just roll it. Like, I just... <laughs> I, I roll too much and move too much. I'm not a good sleeper as it is. It, my brain never shuts off. Yeah, that's a good one. I definitely agree. One thing I can't say about shelters too is I always want to have a good vestibule because I do like the idea. One thing is cool, like a floorless tent, like a teepee, is you could cook in the teepee. Mm-hmm. So I like to have a big vestibule. So like on my Hillenburg, there's a giant vestibule in the front. So I can actually put my jet bar there and cook right there. Because man, like I don't do, I don't know, maybe we will do. I don't go back to camp and make a fire. Like typically when you're hunting, like yeah. you get up at 4 a.m., and you're hiking back, you're getting back probably after dark. You're freaking exhausted. You just want to go to sleep. Yep. Like I, I'm never like out there sitting by the fire, like talking. I don't know. <laughs> like it's not like elk camp or deer camp. Like it's like you're backpacking. So I like freaking, most, most of the time it's cold. I like to freaking get my clothes off, get my Crocs on, I'll jump in my sleeping bag and crack that jet boil open, lay there, turn that, have, and then be able to cook in the tent, not to be sit outside on a rock and do it. So it is nice to have a big jet, big vestibule. I definitely don't. I try and stay away from honestly, like the REI style, Big Agnes, like Coppersburg, you know, the the, like the dome, light. like the traditional dome tent. Yeah, like the ultralights. They just don't have the stuff. Like you need the vegetable for all your gear. Like, there's something mm-hmm. to be said about. There's a big difference between ultralight backpacking and like ultralight hunting. Like you still have a rifle, right? It's about where, where's your rifle going to sleep? You, know, you, you still yeah. have you know, all your optics and your tripods. I don't like to leave this stuff outside because half the time you leave it outside and like. It's rained on or it freezes up. Like it's just, you know, I like to keep it in the tent. So if you have a big vestibule, you can put it in there and do that. And with the floor of this tent, I can bring it inside. And the teepee, like even my Seek Silver Tip, it's just so big. It's so spacious. But they mm-hmm. do require more space as well. People don't realize that either. The Cimarron's could take up, you need a good like 10 foot or 12 foot by 12 foot square, put that sucker up. Oh, yeah. It's oh, oh, yeah. probably getting screwed and having a not as good of a sleep spot. 100%. Yeah. But yeah, that's like, I'm going back to expensive gear thing. Like that's one thing I like. I like, for example, like the guy I was just out shooting with this last weekend. Like we were talking about gear and stuff like that and hunting. Like he wants to get back into hunting this year, and I, he was just asking me some like gear related questions. And I just told him, I was like, dude, just get what you can, but don't feel like you need to have all of the best right now before you can 
go out there and go hunting. You know what I mean? Like just get what you can and just like maybe have a couple of your plan. Like, okay. Next year I'll get like a zero degree bag, but I'll just get by with like my 20 degree this year or just something like that. Or just focus on the necessities and then just add in the items of comfort or the stuff you can, ah, oh, that's, I, I, I can probably swing that this year or maybe that mm, I'll, I'll hold off one more year for that. Um, I just think it's so easy just to know that our culture is, oh, I need to have all this stuff before I can even set foot in the woods. And it helps for sure, but you don't need to have every single possible thing to go out there and have a good time. But yeah, plus it definitely I helps. Have so much stuff that I bought and, and don't use. Yep. Right. And get out there and do it, figure out what you need. That's why I want to hear from you because you've been doing it for so long. You want to learn what works, right? What is necessity? Right. So you got your sleep system, you got your pad. What about food? What are you doing for food? Yeah, food. I've definitely gone a lot of different directions with this over the years. How I do it now is, for example, like a backpack style hunt. I'll typically only bring one to two of the dehydrated, like full on meals, like from you know, Peak Refuel or Heather's Choice or Mountain House or whatever. I'll typically bring one to two of those per day. And then I'll just have a lot of snacks. And typically I'll have one like little sandwich. So I'll, I usually just go to the grocery store before a hunt. I would always get, I, I like to try and eat like relatively clean on the mountain. Like I know it's like not always the most possible thing to do, but I do really value that. So I'll go and get you know, a nice like organic sourdough bread sort of thing. And I like sourdough because it has a lot of good like probiotics and stuff. And it's not generally as processed depending on what brand you buy. But I'll just make some like little salami and cheese sourdough sandwiches because they, if they get smashed, it's, still edible still great and it's nice to break up the of the traditional pastas and you know that are just reheated or the oatmeals or the ramens like it's nice to have something like hearty like with bread especially like a good quality bread but i'll, I'll usually do that for lunch but yeah then i'll usually like i was saying like one to two like backpacking like dehydrated meals and then just like a bunch of different snacks i've gone away from oatmeal i did a lot of oatmeal back when i was first doing this a lot but the thing about oatmeal is like i had to boil water in the morning and sometimes mm -hmm. like depending on the hunt like we would maybe wouldn't wake up with enough time to do that or i on some hunts it's like we only have one little canister of fuel and we have to conserve fuel and then you only get one boil a day kind of a thing so yep. i've gone away from oatmeal whereas i was a staple when i was first starting so a lot of times in the morning i'll just do like a bar just like a good like protein bar you know what i love that I like my favorite. I love granolas, like the, but my favorite one is Alpin Fuel. Have you heard Alpin Fuel yet? Oh, yeah. No, they're awesome. Dude, yeah. They are I think I'm, I'm going to probably start doing some of their stuff this year. And like their oh, little, dude. their little cookie monster cookies. Have you seen those? I haven't tried those. I should have those guys on the podcast too. But dude, yeah, I am like such a fan of those guys. Like I love, because my thing is like you get up and you have an hour hike. You got to get to where you're going. So I'll bring an Alpin Fuel. I'll suck some water out of my straw and then I'll spit it in this thing and I'll just eat right. But like you get there and then you got like at 30 minutes, then I'll eat right before a glass and light. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they have freaking like 800 calories in them. Yeah. And they're no, good. And you don't, so like, you don't have to heat up water. You can just you put it in cold it. water. You spit it in there. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why I, I, I spit it in there because I use a freaking straw. <laughs> so I use a, yeah. <laughs> a camelback. But it's, okay, that's about four ounces. Put it in there. Let that sucker sit. Throw my freaking titanium treasure spork in there. A little plug that we make sporks, 12 bucks. Throw that spork in there and just eat that sucker right there. You don't have to go and boil. Like, again, it's not like you get so caught up. In, it's not backpacking, it's hunting. And it takes a long time to boil water, put it in there, let it heat up. You know, you're talking, that's a 30 or 40 minute process to get that thing by the time you do it. Yeah. Depending. No, and, that's super clutch. Yeah. And I'll piggyback on that too. So I don't use a, like a strawed water bladder, like on my backpack or anything like that. Like, I, I have. I use, yeah, I use Nalgene's and then I have Hydropack. I don't, I'm sure other companies make it too, but just like basically just a water bladder with like a big cap. Um, okay, so I just fill those the, up. I use the MSR. Same thing. Yeah. The Drone Light. Yeah. yeah. Drone Light. I use those. I use those. I do use, I do, I go back and forth. I use Nalgene's. I love Nalgene's. It depends on the hunt I'm on. But a lot of the desert stuff, I just feel like it's easier for me to bring the dig strong. The yeah. Back. But if I'm, if I'm going, if I was going to go to, Colorado or I where it's going to freeze. I'm going to run now jeans. I can't yeah, say I just, one thing is, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. One thing that's nice about warming and breakfast in the morning is that you can like it's warm. If it's really cold, mm -hmm. like it is really nice to have a warm mountain house. But I rarely, 
I might bring one or two of those on a hunt with me. I just almost all of the girl is nice. No matter like. Yeah. No, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do a bunch of different stuff. I do a lot of, like I was saying, like bars, but I actually got turned on. One of my buddies, uh, Hunter McWaters, he turned me on to this thing's called Arari Crackers. And mm. I think I'm saying it right. I'm probably not, but. Those, those rice um, it's, ones? Or like the, it's like a rice cracker and it's wrapped it in rice? seaweed. Okay. And it, it's just, it's so different than like your typical like chocolate peanut butter, or dehydrated mm. chicken Alfredo. Like, I hate bars. I hate bars. Yeah. 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 So like after day seven, you're like, I literally cannot eat another protein bar. And so that's why I like having these little rice crackers because it's just such a different like flavor palette. Like it's like salty and you still get like a good crunch that like a lot of times you don't get on the mountain. Like you just get like a nice crunch. And they actually, they hold up really well in your pack, like getting slammed around and everything. Like they don't break down you know, like a Frito or a Dorito, for example. Like they're not going to just turn to like yeah, dust. Six, like, they're actually pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. So I got turned on to those by Hunter and I've been really liking those. I'm also big on just like little energy chews, like just like those little mm-hmm. like cliff energy chews. I think they're called like energy blocks or something like that. Mm-hmm. I just pop those sometimes just for a quick boost of sugar, boost of caffeine. They're fairly different clean. Texture, like, something else. Yeah, different okay. texture. Put them in, um, your, put in my pocket, like when I'm packing out, and I'll throw them oh, yeah. out. I'm back in those remains. Yeah, love those, and it's quicker than sitting down and like mixing together like a coffee or a ignite or something like that. Sometimes it's nice just to pop it, like you said, like in your pocket, just grab and go. But yeah, I run a lot of different foods. I, it's like one of my favorite things to like is to try different snacks and different foods. That's probably one of the most like fluid parts of my like gear system is like the food I bring on a hunt. But a lot of times, like. I'll bring, I'll ration myself like two like peak meals, for example, for our day. But a lot of times I'll only try to eat one, especially if it's like a, a seven to 10 day hunt where it's like, it could go 10, but we only brought enough food for seven. Sometimes I'll just like ration food. And that's, I, I've had several hunts where that's like actually like paid dividends because it allowed me and the hunter to have a couple extra days worth of food because we were just like doing a lot of glassing and not as much like physical exertion. So I was able to like, back off on the calorie intake a little bit and conserve mm-hmm. some extra meals and stuff for the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings of the hunt. I love bringing, there's a few things I really like to bring last couple of years. If it's really cold, I like bringing ramen. Oh, not I love like, ramen. Not like the, like I'll go to the Asian store and get like a legit ramen, not like the Same. top ramen and stuff. You yeah, I can't mean, like, do can't do the generic. You gotta go get like, the quality, like, like organic. Spicy ramen, dude. Yeah, the good ramen. We live in San Diego, it's a big old Asian community here. Go get some really good ramen. That's really good, especially with like the middle of the day. It's just nice to get that in you. So it's almost like the, it's like the comfort of that. Another thing I really like to bring is like I'll bring like a couple like logs of salami. Yeah, just put some chunks off of that, and then some cheeses. Just bring the little yep. I like the Tillamook cheeses, right? Oh, or yeah. even like the, the baby bells, dude. If you do, it's just like you get like day five into a hunt, and all you're eating is Reese's peanut butter cups and Fritos. Can't do it. It sucks. Like you just like you're gonna you're, bonk. Like, you get a bonk and like you're looking at your buddy who has cheese. And you're just like, I want that so badly. Yeah. You know, like you want fresh things. There's something fresh about eating salami or eating not a freeze dried meal. Plan like, dude, like it's just, you're just farting so bad. It's just, I do so much of it. Like even on the bar thing, dude, like I've tried doing like the cream belly bars and stuff. Dude, more power to them. Everyone likes them, but dude, I start gagging trying to eat that stuff. Like, it's just this dried out bar. <laughs> I'm trying to get yeah. down. It's just, I'd much rather bring along something fresh with me. I'd much rather bring along, along like even the tuna packets, like the Sunkiss tuna packets. Oh, yeah. Those are, good those are great. With, yeah. Do those things or with, I'll do flatbread. That way you know, it doesn't work up too bad. Yeah. Tortillas are great too. Yeah. So I was going to say for ramen, another hack I do just to get more protein in my ramen is I just bring those little like beef bone broth sticks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And each one is like 10 grams of protein. So like pretty decent. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll add that into my ramen and it like, not only does the flavor like get even better, but I, you know, I'm getting a little extra protein in there. And yeah, I think it has like them. collagen and a couple of other like really good stuff. Yeah. There's some, I can't remember which one I, I got it from in, in Gertie Bowman. They had it on there, like what they're using, but it's some like super organic, healthy bone broth stuff and has all that stuff in there. It's, it's going to be, I put, start putting those in the ramen as well. Just you know, drink the broth and you're down. Plus like when you, like water sucks. It's the worst. And if you're, especially if you're hunting somewhere that's just like water is a thousand feet below you or 2000 feet below you, drink that water. Like you need to drink that water with that ramen because you, you want all the water you can. You're not dumping that stuff out. Yeah. Um, another thing that I love for 
that I like the last two seasons I've been running is the Celsius powders. R- like, they have know, powder, dude. I'm telling you, like, I know we're supposed to run like mountain ops and stuff because it's a cool thing to do. You will never go back. It is so delicious. Really, they have like 200 grams of caffeine in them. I, it's supposed to be like 12. I do it in a whole 32 ounce Nalgene. and shake that sucker up. I always have an algae with me no matter what. Dude, they are so good. <laughs> They're like so tasty. They have the strawberry lemonade one and uh, like all the flavors. And it's 15 bucks for like 10 of them at Walmart. Dang, I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, because I usually bring at least one Ignite stick per day, typically. Mm-hmm. Or if it's like a really physical hunt, I'll bring one of their like BCA sticks. Mm-hmm. But I do really think those help like my level of soreness mm-hmm. on certain hunts. I love their BCA. I mean, I'm not knocking mountain ups. They have great stuff. Like I yeah. love their BCAA powder. Like I do it after the gym. Like it just, it's like refreshing. But dude, like I feel like these Celsiuses are just like, it's like drinking. I like them more than regular Celsius cans. Like yeah, I'll have good. to try that. Dude, yeah, because so a lot good. of the fishing stuff I film, like in the summertime on the East Coast, like all the guys I film with are like just hooked on Celsius. And so right. I, I never, it's funny. You know, one of those things, I never drink Celsius when I'm like back home or whatever. But like whenever I'm on the East Coast, I'll grab one or two just because it's, I don't know, it's like what everybody like drinks on like the crew I'm on. So it's just fun. Yeah, I switched to the sugar free monsters. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. I'm a fan of the sugar free monsters for sure. So, that's your snack food and then dinner you just are you run what do you run for a stove i basically just have one of those like titanium cups like just the super ultralight basic like almost like kettle cup and then it says like a little lid on the top of it mm-hmm. um, i think it's a i think mine's a seek outside they just have like a, a kind of a generically branded one and then i have the little tiny little stove that goes on top of the the butane fuel mm-hmm. canister and i want to say it's like Soto is the brand S O T O, if I remember right. And then I just put that in there. It has like an automatic like lighter built into it, but I just feel like those this kind is of this is like the twelve dollar one of Amazon, right? Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Dude, I ran the um, same one for years. Yeah, yeah. and same same I've had like everything fits I've in the cup. Two of them. Yeah, fits in the cup. It's awesome. I've had two mm-hmm. of them. Both of them I've broke the lighters on. That could have been just user error. So I always have a, a lighter in there as well. Sometimes it works, sometimes I don't. But having a lighter, it's like it'll always work. I really like that because it's a pretty small footprint. Like put everything in the cup and then have a little drawstring bag for it. And I just cinch it up. It doesn't take up that much space. It's pretty light. I also have one of those like jet can, jet boil can little refillers. So it has a female and a male top with a little screw. It's like, like so dude, yeah. It they're, so I, don't, I, I tell so every, I, I'm shocked. I talk to so many people like in the industry so many people just don't have that and it's just like a no-brainer gear item at least I in my opinion because like it. i've it's had so it for it. yeah i've had it for man like four years now and i just now i only buy the big ones and i, I should send you a photo of all the cans i have like in my garage right now because i'm like going through and filling them right now but i just buy the big ones and i just refill my tiny guys and it's just awesome and i want to say i got it on ebay for 35 bucks just this little refiller yeah. thing dude i need to get one of those so I used to run that same stove, same setup, because it was ultra light. But then, dude, like I started using a jet boil, and like I know it's bougie, but it's so nice. <laughs> it's they're so nice. nice. They're def- They're better. A hundred. Like I, I kind. I probably. It's should. a space thing, though. It's a space yeah. thing too. It definitely. Yeah, it's a space thing. The jet boil is bigger, but it burns faster and more efficient, in my opinion. Because mm-hmm. there's definitely days I'm on there, like on the mountain, and it's like windy or like really pretty cold, and my thing struggles to get a boil man it, sometimes it takes i feel like five minutes to get a boil going where's my jet boil like a guy i'm hunting with a jet boil his boiled in 90 seconds and he's eating his, his food already especially if you're sharing like um, my buddy kellen we're big on we hunt together we're, we're pretty simple dudes we'll share a stove like we can work together my other buddies i'm like i'm bringing my own stove i don't want to deal with you so if you're splitting the weight and i'm carrying the gas you're carrying the stove like it's really not that bad to carry that thing i'm not that heavy but it does no. take up a lot more space compared to like, that little can but it is nice, like I said, for like boiling like ramen and stuff. Like it's just not as it's more stable too. It's like better. so I do like that. Dude, speak of like truck stuff, dude. I got their Genesis stove this year. It is the greatest piece of gear I bought all year. Really? Sites from my stuff I made, the Tracer stuff, it is the greatest piece of gear I got all year. I got the double Genesis stove. Dude, it is like the Coleman stoves. Yeah. Oh yeah. It smokes them. Like it, really? it gets freaking hot. Dude, it is the greatest thing I bought all year. It comes with two pots, like two like 
with the comes with a pan and then it comes with the stove and it has like a big boiling pot. So dude, like we cooked all of our food in that thing, like on our um a couple of our hunts, our elk hunt, our deer hunt this year. It is awesome. I have multiple hunts we use it on. And it just it cooks up super quick, just like a jet boil. And it's super compact. It folds down to this tiny thing. It's not this like big metal green thing you're carrying around. Like it's just it's those mm-hmm. Genesis stoves are dope. Like three hundred bucks, but it's like what type of fuel does it take? Is like cream propane tank, or you can like even put. You can also get like an adapter to put your jet boil onto it. So if you're like really, so like run your jet boil off that green tank too, like off of the Genesis. No way. Done that yet? That's like its own star, dude. It it like folds up. It looks like I don't like it's like a round ball, but it's dude. It's freaking all fits in the pot. It's legit. It's an awesome piece. I gotta check that out. Dude, it is an awesome piece of gear for sure. I, I actually have him coming on next week on the podcast. I got him Jeff Boyle to talk about. Oh, sick. I'm so stoked on this thing, though. <laughs> yeah. This out of your way. Yeah. But I was going to say another piece of gear. So, like, I recently watched a video on Go On's YouTube channel. They were talking about like a possibles kit. And I, I think they had John Barclow from Sitka talking about what you want in your pack, no matter what, a fire starter kit, first aid, that kind of thing. For filming, I have one of those little bags as well. So I was going to briefly mention that I like to just have just a couple extra lens caps in there, some little Zeiss lens wipe, just like the alcohol lens wipes in there. One of those like little blowers, which is good to have for your, you know, your spotter, your bino or whatever. If you ever need to get dust out of something or you know, dust off your sensor or whatever like that, that's really handy to have. And I also like, because I'm like always having to charge stuff, I have one of every single USB cord in there, like in my pack at all times. So because I've been on hunts and I've, been like four miles five miles in there and i realized i like don't have an iphone cord or i don't have a USB C cord to charge my camera with my power banks and i've had to like hunt all day and then I'll do 10 miles or whatever and then night comes when most guys are we're back climbing our tents making our jet boil food and going to bed i <laughs> this is why i always have this in my pack and i'll never forget it's because i was on a hunt like that and i forgot and i had to hike out 10 miles well, five miles down to the truck and five miles back up that night and that was just imprinted into my memory. I was like, I can never, ever forget a USB C cable, like ever again. Learn from my mistakes. Always have a, if you're filming a hunt, like always have every single possible cord you could possibly need, which like generally is just like an iPhone cord, a micro USB, and then like a standard USB C cable. And hopefully, as technology continues to, to go this way, it'll all be USB C just for sake of use. I know the new iPhones have USB C and, I don't know why it took them so long to switch to that that cable, but I'm a huge fan of USB C. Really, they're not the the white thing, stick thing. The lightning, no, yeah, they're they've been slowly like murmuring it and talking about switching to USB C, but this last one with the iPhone 15, they finally switched. It would be awesome, dude, because like you, I literally have to have three or four different cables. Oh yeah, it's the worst. Like the droid stuff and the, the, like the mini USB, the USB C, and then the iPhone. It's just, yeah, it's, it's terrible. So if everything was the same thing, it would just be, it'd be awesome. I'm not for government intervention, but if you want to get involved in that and make everyone go to USB C, I'd be stoked. Everything's the same. But I think that's what made Apple do it. Cause I, I, I want to say, got involved in that some, some yeah. way. Like they're trying to make a new core or something like that. And they're like, oh, no. Yeah, I'm also not for that at all. But yeah, I also <laughs> like that they did that. <laughs> yeah, saw, yeah. Small example of that, but yeah. Overall, I'm obviously not for that, but yeah, I think the European Union or something like that, I read an article that they were like outlawing or making everything have to be USB-C by a certain year. How much but, of your hunt do you film on your iPhone? And just like long lens stuff or I, I use it a lot. I just take, if I got like a really cool clip or like something I know that I'm going to use, like I'll write it down my notes or something like that. Or obviously for mapping, if we're in an area where it's, I need maps to like, get to a water source or if something were to happen to me and the hunter we get separated or whatever i can like finally back to camp or whatnot but yeah and then with the USB C cable all my cameras are like mirrorless cameras now so i can charge with just the USB C into my canon cameras and then i just have these like little anchor they're called anchor is the brand but you, you have to have a certain one and it has to say pd on it which means like power delivery which means like it exceeds a certain threshold of power that it's able to output Basically, I want to say 20 watts or 18 watts. But basically, that's the one that I need for my cameras. And I just basically have a little solar panel also from Anchor that I just got on Amazon. I think 80 bucks 
Um, and I just charge up those power banks with that. And then from those power banks, I just plug into my cameras at night. Or if I have a long day and we're just on a glassing knob and you know it's like the lulls of the hunt, um, I'll just I'll plug it in. I charge it at midday. Yeah, because you're putting you're putting typically five to ten day hunt into a twenty minute film. Yeah. So I guess I, you probably thought we were talking about filming hunts. So that's how we talked about your gear list, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> So it's really important. It's, it's super, it's like one of the it's, biggest. It's awesome. Um, That's why I want to hear yeah. from guys like you. They're actually doing it. Like you're actually out there like real world doing it. What gear are you using? I love to hear that stuff from people. So you went on seven hunts last year. Who, wh- who'd you film for last year? What films did you do? Yeah. So I did, let's see, September. I did my first hunt of the year was with Western Hunter with Nate Simmons. We did an elk hunt together and have a whirlwind i don't think he's like really officially posted it but he shot a really nice bull on opening day in wyoming and it was crazy like one of the craziest hunts ever filmed i don't want to spoil it too much but it was crazy <laughs> it was also crazy because i had covid and we were like at ten thousand feet and i was just sucking air through a straw is what it felt like and the whole time we were like we hiked in there spent the night before the season opened and the whole time, like my family was praying for me. I was praying to the Lord. And I was like, Lord, if there was ever a hunt, because it was supposed to be a 10 day hunt. I was like, if there was ever a hunt that I could pull a card and have a miracle happen and we tag out on day one, like this would be it. Cause I am like a shell of myself right now. I can't breathe. I'm just hacking. I'm coughing. I, I'm going to be loud. <laughs> I was just like, and this was just, I don't know, all the like the negative thoughts were into your head. I'm getting home with Nate Simmons. Like, I love this guy. Looked up to him for a while. Been really looking forward to this hunt. This is just an awesome experience. And of course, I'm sick. Like, I was fighting that, fighting those demons on my shoulders, like telling me, oh, like, how could this happen? You're such a loser, blah, blah, blah. But I was just trying to pray through that. And the next morning, we got it done op- opening morning. And I was just like, my jaw was on the floor like, two days straight. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I've been on a lot of elk hunts where that is like the farthest thing from reality where it's always yeah. a grind and either doesn't happen or happens towards the end. But yeah, so we got super blessed on that one. And then, yeah, fast forward after that hunt, my wife, actually, we went bear hunting with one of my friends here in Idaho, Gavin Wallace, and she got a bear, kind of a random thing. Like we we're, so that hunt got done early. So you I actually filmed, had a couple of days. You filmed that hunt too? Oh, uh, I actually did. Yeah. So <laughs> my hunt with Nate got done early. And so I was able to be able to come home and then basically my buddy Gavin reached out to me, Hey, you know, I've got some hounds and we're going to go out I'm going to go out and run them and kind of do some training with them. Like, do you guys want to go on a little bear hunt, try and get a bear for your wife? And I was like, sure, why not? I'm home a day early or whatever. So we went out there and kind of same thing, just got like ridiculously blessed and we got a bear treed within a mile of where we released the dogs at. And it was my wife's first big game animal. And she did awesome, handled the whole thing like a total pro. And yeah, I was just, and I, I ended up bringing my camera that day just to like, at first, just to like, like a home video. Like I was just like, I just want to like document this and you know, cause I'll never know what's going to happen. Like I was saying on a hunt, you just never know what's going to happen. And then lo and behold, we like treat a bear and got up to it. And it's just a nice boar and beautiful kind of like reddish brown, almost like a little bit of like purple coloring, just a beautiful bear. And yeah. She made a perfect shot. The bear climbed to the tree like five yards and was dead in less than 10 seconds. And it was crazy. And I've actually put like a little like seven minute video together for it. And I just submitted it to the Full Draw Film Festival. And she didn't know I was going to do that because she was like wanting me to. Because she like the video turned out pretty decent. But she's like, I really want you to submit it to Full Draw Film Festival. And I was like, oh, I think it already happened or whatever. But I surprised her and submitted it. I I just recently told her and she was pretty, pretty happy. So That's awesome. But, you don't really produce your own. You know, I want to keep going. I don't want to keep cutting up with where you're going, but you don't produce your own. It's, you don't really do like your own films. Like people are just like everyone else's film. And you're like names. Yeah. And titles. Like you don't have like a Luke's hunting film YouTube channel, right? Like it's, nope. you're doing everybody else's stuff. Okay. Yeah. I usually just, for the last few years, I've just been contracting out. And the, honestly, I just feel like that's not my place right now. Like just fill in needs of companies and individuals who just reach out to me like, Hey, this is the hunt we have or the story we want told. Do you want to do it? And that's just like where my heart's been and just where I've been seeing doors continue to open. Like I was saying earlier, like just that have blown my mind. And so I just want to, in this season of my life, at least just keep going through those doors. And I don't know, I just haven't really seen like the need maybe is not the right word, but I just haven't really had the desire to like 
you know, the Luke hunting film show or whatever you would call it on YouTube. Like I've just seen more of the need of telling stories for people who need stories told. Gotcha. All right. So you went on those two hunts. Where, where did you go next? Uh, after that, I went on a hunt with Sitka and it was a sheep hunt in Montana. And also that one really has not been posted or shared online. So I don't want to say too much, but it was also equally as epic as the hunt with Nate Simmons. And I believe it should be coming out. I'm not sure in what capacity. I think they're still working on that. But sometime around the summer, uh, this summer of 2024, um, it should be out on YouTube and stuff like that. So be looking that's for that one. But name. that one, big name that people, was awesome. Dude. That's a, that's a yeah. That's the big name. Sitka's the big name, dude. That's a big name company. It was an awesome it, experience. Sheep hunt is not an easy tag to draw. So like you getting the you know, the the nod for that is it's just a bit it's, it's something to put a feather in your cap for. It's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, like I said, just super thankful I got to be a part of that one. It was yeah, an amazing experience. So Sitka, who's next? Um, after that, we actually, I was going to maybe do another elk hunt, but I decided just to, my wife really wanted to go elk hunting this year. And so I just decided to block off the last 10 days of the month. And we just elk hunted in Idaho with one of my buddies in Oregon who actually drew a non-res tag. He came over and hunted with us and we just had one of the best like 10 day stints of hunting like I've ever had. Like I said, like we got, we were able to get a cow elk down in our group, but um, we just had, excuse me. A lot of just amazing encounters. Like I shot and missed two elk. And I should have maybe hit them, but both arrows hit branches. And my wife got to see both, which is equally embarrassing, but also it was really cool for her to see and experience like being close to elk, see them talk and see them do their thing. And hopefully next year learning from my mistakes that I need mm-hmm. to shoot my bow more. <laughs> but yeah, it was really cool. She got to have some close encounters too after my misses because she was like, okay, I'm done or you're done. I'm up first. <laughs> so. But yeah, it was awesome, man. We just made some really good memories and yeah, I just, I'll never forget it. Awesome. And then you filmed with Go Hunt. Did you film with Leopold last year or the year before? No, I did this year too. I did a hunt Leopold. with them for their Project Hunt series, which I'm not, I don't know if you ever are aware of it, but it's basically like anyone can apply for it. And it's just, you know, it could be basically it's like a hunt you apply for. Oh, sorry. Let me back that up. It's what you, so you'll either draw a hunt or you have, a, I'm just butchering this. I'm so sorry. If you get a bitch and hunt, like you go and draw a sheep tag, you could apply to the appointment. Okay, I got this hunt. Do you want to film it for me? Exactly. Or you could equally say, Hey, I do this hunt every single year. It's over the counter with my dad or my grandpa or whatever. And it's this hunt. I've been doing it for 20 years or whatever. Basically like the story can be really anything from this incredibly once in a lifetime hunt to like. Just a, a general hunt you do with your family. And you basically just make a little two minute video about it and you just send it into to Leopold. And then they go through all the different entries and they narrow it down to a couple. And then typically they'll, from that couple, they'll narrow it down to sometimes one, but the last two years they've been doing two. And then from there they'll, they'll reach out to the finalists and be like, Hey, we've selected your hunt. Would you like us to, to film it basically? And most of the time they say yes. <laughs> And, but yeah, so this year I was fortunate enough to get to do another one of those for that campaign again, uh, for the project hunt campaign. And it was for a guy named Cody and he actually was diagnosed with MS. I have a really cool story. I'm really excited to put this one together. I'm actually working on it right now. But he was diagnosed with MS. Um, Yeah, these ones I do. Yeah. All the editing as well. If you do a go hunt film, you edit it the whole thing. So in years past, they've had an editor putting together the go hunt originals this year. I worked it out so that the ones I'm doing this year, I'm going to be editing, which is good. Cause like I, it's always been hard for me to find work in the spring. So just having a little bit of extra editing work has been a huge blessing. That's awesome. But yeah. So but going back to the, the project, hunt, yeah, so this, yeah. this guy named Cody, he was diagnosed with MS. And I want to say the date was August 4th, 2022. And then, you know, 32, 33 years old, young guy, super nice dude. Just randomly got diagnosed with MS. Just, no real outstanding symptoms. It just kind of just hit him. And then he basically, hey, you know, he's grown up hunting his whole life. He's from the Midwest. He's always had a dream of going on a, like a wilderness elk hunt on horseback in Wyoming. And he had enough points. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to burn my points this year. Like MS is a thing where it could be debilitating a year from now, or you could live to be 70, 80, 90 and have a, a relatively healthy life. It just hits everybody differently. But he, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose the, to not let that let this not let this define me and go out and pursue adventures that you know 
I want to do before I die. And I basically cashed in his points, told his dad, hey, I drew this tag. You're coming with me. It's going to be an awesome father or son experience. And then lo and behold, like I, exactly a year to the day that he was diagnosed, like Leopold didn't know this, but they reached out to him on that same day. And we were like, hey, you've been selected to be our finalist for Project Hunt. And so that was like a pretty cool God moment, in my opinion, just like almost like a full circle thing, you know, just for Cody, but also just for like the story of it all. I mean, you just couldn't write a better story than that. So then Leopold reached out to me and I was like, absolutely. Like, I wanted, I would love the opportunity to tell the story because I've had some people in my family with MS and it's like hits close to home. So yeah, I, I basically packed up my stuff right after I elk hunt in Idaho and headed over to Wyoming, met up with Cody, met him and his dad, and basically r- rode in 11 miles on horses right after meeting them. And then we had two days of snow. It was pretty like terrible weather and good for hunting because it, it does help the hunting, but it was the first two days we basically were just stuck in the wall tent, just hanging out and getting to know each other. And then the third day came and the, the storm cleared and we rode out at seven in the morning. And the first elk we saw was a beautiful six point and Cody made a perfect shot, shot him at 200 yards. And it's, it was a really like special story. I don't, I don't want to spoil like too much about it, but it's a story that is just going to be a great film because it's just so much more about life and then then just like what happened on the hunt and not that there's not a place for incredible hunt stories of things that take place on a hunt and can inspire you and give you things to take away and impact on your daily life but this one was just like a really unique story that i'm just like i said really excited to put together and tell his whole story of who he is and how it was going through the diagnosis and how that changed his life and then fast forward to the hunt and kind of having the hunt be like a vignette for conquering the challenges of life and being successful and yeah like i said i don't want to spoil it too much but i'm really excited for that one yeah i like how you've been like since the beginning of this podcast you've been saying story and not hunt it's like you film this story that's where i feel like i like i film a hunt right you're capturing a story and that's like i think you're so talented at doing this when i watch one of your one of your hunts i'm actually feel like i'm there and i'm seeing this whole thing unfold and that's what's so awesome about what you do. So you go from Leopold. Now, who else are you home with next year? Last year. Yeah. So after that hunt, I came back. First of all, I want to say thank you, Drew. That really means a lot, man. But I would say I can't really, I don't know if I can really piggyback onto that statement, but I would just say I just feel super blessed to be able to tell these stories on these hunts. And I, I get to tell a lot of cool stories in my work. Like I said, like the fishing stuff, I get to do some stuff like in the music industry. I get to do some stuff in the ministry. You know, like doing like mission trips and stuff like that. And I, and that's one of my favorite parts of my job is I can use photography and video in all these different like aspects of life and different you know, quote unquote industries, whatever you want to call them. They're just different stories that need to be told. And I like not being a pinned down into one specific like industry or one specific niche. I like doing a lot of different stuff. And I just feel like that's really where my calling is at like right now in this season of my life. But so yeah, back to hunting. So yeah, after that hunt with Leopold, I did a hunt with Go Hunt. It was actually with, with Brady, and it was his elk hunt that he drew this year for muzzleloader. And I also don't want to spoil it too much either because the film has not come out yet. Yeah, but he, yeah, it was definitely a tough hunt. It was a very, very well sought after draw, limited entry type hunt. It was open sight muzzleloader, which is my first ever muzzleloader hunt filming. So that was a unique challenge because I wasn't sure you know, creatively. I'm like, am I going to go with like more like a long lens setup or like a kind of like a medium short range setup and then just have a spotter? Because you know, that's typically what I do for like a rifle hunt. But for like an archery hunt, I'll opt more for something like a 24 to 105 and a 70 to 200. But then for a rifle hunt, I'll just maybe like a 24 to 70 and like a 1 to 500 kind of a thing. I don't want to get too technical with the lenses and stuff like that, but because I wasn't sure, is he going to try and shoot? Because he was telling me before the hunt, yeah, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with this thing out to 400 yards. And I was like, holy smokes, <laughs> open sight. That's crazy. But Brady is like one of the most proficient shooters I know and probably one of the most proficient shooters in North America. So I was just like, all right, like anything out there, I'm just totally trusting and whatever they're comfortable with, I'm comfortable with. And we'll just see how it goes. So yeah, we like chased around. It sounds crazy, but like an eight by nine bull for a few days. And got like pretty close a couple of times and you know, just we're having a really good time. It was me, him and Omar out there in the desert, just running around, hiking around these like crazy mountains, seeing like 
just an insane amount of elk. Like I said, it was just like an amazing place, amazing unit, amazing bulls. And it was just a really awesome experience. And then Omar had to go back to work. And then fast forward a few days of just looking over bulls, analyzing them, be like, oh, for this tag, I think we can maybe do like a smidge better or oh, that one's like way too young or whatever like that. Lo and behold, we found this bull and he was just like an old bull, like away from the cows, which um, for some reason, the rut, it seemed like last year was maybe like a little bit delayed because this was like mid-October and there was still like a lot of bulls with cows. So it was nice to find one that was like away from the cows and didn't have as many eyes on it and stuff. Cause we still wanted to like with the muzzle to try and get in close. But yeah, so we put a stock on him, got in close, but then we just ran out of light and just couldn't make it happen. And then the next day it snowed typical for a Brady Miller hunt. And we turned him up again in the same area. We hiked, hiked back down into that Canyon, got up and then we got in, I think it was around like 280 or 300 yards. and I'll let the rest I'd be shown on video, but basically ended with a gigantic bull on the ground and a crazy story, but it was pretty crazy. Yeah. It was the biggest bull I've filmed on a hunt yet die. It was, it was a crazy experience. Like I had, we walked up on it and it was the biggest bull I'd ever seen you know, in real life, like in front of me. It was just really, it was really not emotional. At, experience. Not at Cabela's or Shields. Yeah. Not at Cabela's or anything like that. It was a really cool experience. And we spent two days cleaning him up and, and getting him out of there. And yeah, it was just a really good time. Really good hunt with Brady. Made some good memories with them. Yeah, it was a good story. Really good story. That's awesome, dude. We're like at the hour and a half mark on this thing. I've been normally an hour podcast, but we can go all day. Just uh, you, just awesome stories, dude. I guess. Maybe we'll have to do a part two. We'll have to do a part two, man. Get back on and yeah. do it again. I'll bring you back on and do it again because you're a fun podcast. I want to do. Uh, I want to hear about this season too. Where can we find you? What do you got coming up? What films are dropping? How can we support you? Yeah, I would say, first of all, thank you so much for having me on because this has been awesome. And I seriously can't believe it's been an hour and a half. <laughs> but yeah, I would say some of the main places you can see some of my stuff, are like the Leopold YouTube channel, there's a number of films on there, um, as well as the Go Hunt YouTube channel. But then I'll also be trying to like share and post as much as I can like on my socials this, this year. I'm just kind of resharing the brands that I'm I've made films for, but also I'm making films for this year. My Instagram is just my name, Luke Duesenberg. And yeah, I've got, I, I try and post like all my hunting films and stuff on my, web, on my website too, which is just Luke Duesenberg photography.com. But that's probably a pretty good place to see most of it, but, or just reach out, if, send me a DM if you want to see some stuff or whatever. That's awesome. Thanks dude. We'll do part two again sooner than later. Cause uh, this was fun. Be blessed, bro. Thanks for coming on. Definitely. Thanks so much, man.